Hello, welcome to the conversation in New Central Television. This is a program where we bring you up to speed with all the political happenings on the African continent. I am Benga Aborowa. And I am Rita Modia. Now, to, on today's edition of the conversation, there seems to be another brewing feud between neighbors Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Rwanda earlier in the week accused the RC of abandoning a deal aimed at bringing peace to the latter's volatile east as tensions spiral between the neighbors. Talks between the DRC and Rwanda in the Angola capital, Luanda, unlocked a truce agreement in November 2022. But both countries have since been trading blamings for failing to uphold their part of the commitments. Well, it's been nearly a year since European leaders and their African counterparts converged in Brussels for a summit billed as the beginning of a renewed partnership between the two continents. At the end of the summit, several promises and agreements were made to foster positive relations between both continents, but almost a year later, European leaders and their African counterparts are still struggling to fulfill any. Mm. Uh, yeah, like I remember back in February 2022 when this happened, and there were a lot of renewed promises between the e EU and the mm -hmm. EU summit, and, you know, we expected a lot of things for the European Union to do. I mean, promises are very easy to make. It's delivering. I mean, you just have to look at the politicians around you, and most of this... Uh, leaders that go there, uh, politicians. But mm. it was called Vision 2030. Yeah. So maybe it's too early. It's not even a year yet to mm. start taking stock. But uh, you'll know if you're making progress or not. And also, election year in Africa. We're mm -hmm. moving closer to the Nigerian elections, uh, Liberian elections, yeah. and also Gabon. Yeah, so interesting to see how things uh, play out. And away from um, elections, I mean, DRC and Rwanda, we see how tensions... Uh, I don't know when we were tensions. going to see the end of this dispute. So they said M23 withdrew, and uh, the Congolese president said, you know, they're pretending like they withdrew. They're just maneuvering mm -hmm. and fooling everybody. And then on the other side, so it's accusations and counter-accusations, and I look forward to our discussion definitely especially subject. since we're preparing yes. for elections in dr congo also, also so we'll definitely see how that pans out but on our first topic now despite hopes of a new partnership being built europe is perceived to be struggling to implement financial pledges on investment and infrastructure which made it to Af which it's made to africa in brussels last year at the european and african union summit tagged as a new beginning between europe and africa Heads of governments of the member states of the African Union and the European Union met for the 6th EU-AU summit, which agreed on a 150 million euros investment package that will support the joint vision for 2030 agenda for sustainable development and AU agenda 2063. At least a 450 million vaccine doses to Africa by mid-2022, while energy and infrastructure will be supported with over $300 billion. Now, the meeting was co-chaired by the President of the European Council, Charles Michel, and the President of Senegal, and the Chairperson of the African Union, Macky Sall, had other areas of interest, which included reciprocal partnership for migration mobility, renewed cooperation for peace and security in Africa, strengthening Africa's health systems, continental economic integration, amongst others. Now, joining us live in the conversation to discuss this, I have Colin Sumweke, Global Affairs Analyst. He joins us from the capital of Belgium, Brussels, which also happens to be uh, where the headquarters of the European Union is. A warm welcome to you, Colin. Thank you, Wenga, for having me. Happy New Year, since this Happy is our New first Year. engagement uh, since the beginning of the year. We also have the pleasure of having uh, Professor Emeritus uh, Mukesh Kapila, a former senior UN official. Uh, he joins us live in Manchester in England. A warm welcome to you, Prof. Thank you. Glad to be here. Now, I'd like to start with you, uh, Prof. It's been almost a yes since the much ambitious uh, EU AU summit uh, that was uh, said to be a renewed partnership. Uh, what's your evaluation on the implementation of the agreements that were agreed to almost a year ago? Has there been any progress report on this, or is it too early for us to start taking stock? I think the generous view would be that it is a bit too early. Uh, uh, the both continents are busy. Europe is preoccupied by the war on its periphery with, uh, in Ukraine and record number of refugees, 
uh, and uh, Brexit uh, leaving, uh, leaving uh, you know, the UK leaving the EU, still in turmoil. And on the African side, I think several government, uh, countries are having elections. Uh, there have been crises and disasters. Climate uh, change is overshadowing everything, uh, food insecurity and, uh, um, and, uh, uh, and uh, inflation, energy prices. So uh, there's a lot to occupy the leaders of both uh, uh, continents. And so, and my final point here on, you know, on this particular question, you know, we can't speak of uh, Africa as a whole, and we can't speak of uh, uh, Europe as a whole. In the end, these investments that were promised in that summit will have to be done piecemeal, country by country, uh, uh, sub-region by sub-region, perhaps. Mm. So in that sense, uh, I think you can have grand uh, agreements. But in the end, uh, the rubber hits the road in specific countries. And that, to me, is still not clear where these things are going to be implemented. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Kapila. Now I'd like to bring in Collins into all of this. Now, Professor Kapila has given so many reasons. I mean, we talk about Vision 2030. But while all this is going on and we kind of understand the delay, we also know that due to the delay, for the interests of Africa, lots of things have been happening. Food insecurity, drought in Somalia has been going on. Now, can you say that the excuse of the Russia-Ukraine war and lots of things that the other African or European countries are facing is enough excuse or is enough reason why we do not have a thorough or full implementation of this pledge that was given last year? Thank you, Rita, for that uh, very pointed uh, question. Uh, there is absolutely no doubt that um, these events that were unforeseen have uh, caused some sort of uh, distractions. But you see, policy papers are not cast in concrete. There are, and they remain, some sort of roadmap to guide you towards a certain direction that you intend uh, to take along with your partners. Now, it is also foreseen in policy papers that there will be hiccups. And when there are hiccups, how do you come back to the negotiating table to begin to look at those hiccups and how you actually um, you know, find uh, emerulating uh, elements to actually um, you know, uh, take care of them, get rid of them? Um, in my part of uh, Nigeria, where I uh, you know, uh, came from before my sojourn to Europe, there is a saying that um, if you are looking for a monkey up on the, uh, on the top of the tree, you need to first find his excreta somewhere on the ground before you know that there is an indication that there is a monkey up there in the tree. Hmm. Now, to apply it to um, the um, uh, so-called joint vision for 2023, yes, the Ukraine war is an issue. Yes, the election in Africa, in different African countries, among which um, you know Nigeria, is an issue. But that was known uh, even before the um, you know uh, the agreement uh, was uh, was signed. Now, what the two partners do to actually show that there is this sustained commitment to actually see through that joint vision 2023 is in program. 2023 is a strategic vision. It is a long way to go. But there are low-hanging fruits that they need to begin to pluck immediately, even before the pen with which the ink, rather, with which the agreement was signed could dry up. What we are saying, those of us that are concerned about non-implementation of um, the um, you know, tenets of uh, the agreement, what we are saying is that there are no visible signs of any progress being made, quite apart from um, you know, very little tokenism here and there on the part of the European uh, Union, but also on the part of uh, the African Union, uh, there is this continued sense of lack of purpose in terms of 
establishing a strategic position and following it uh, through. So there is enough blame to go around. Maybe, just maybe, there are things going on that are not immediately visible to ordinary mortals like you and I, but then that is where strategic communication uh, comes in, because they need to communicate more. If there are things going on, preparatory arrangements going on behind the scenes, they need to communicate to us. But as far as we can see, with our mortal eyes, there isn't very much going on. And sorry, I do not agree with the point that it is too early to expect things to happen. Preliminary arrangements should have been in place. We are not seeing those. And the conclusion we can draw from that is that, again, this is simply big on ambition, but very, very small on actions. Thank you, uh, Colin. So I'd like to bring in uh, Professor Kapila from Geneva. Uh, now, Professor, Africa and Europe, uh, the relationship has always uh, seemed to be a very paternalistic uh, relationship from Europe down to Africa. Just last week, about 50 women were abducted in Arabinda in Burkina Faso. I remember 2015 and the aftermath of the Paris bombing, uh, a lot of African heads of states uh, flew to Paris and uh, the hashtag Je suis uh, Paris uh, was going on and uh, African heads of states held the hands of uh, Francois Hollande, the then president, and they marched on the streets of Paris. We haven't seen uh, such a reciprocal gesture. Even Africans are not uh, showing solidarity towards Burkina Faso. So how do we improve uh, this relationship between Europe and Africa and make it more uh, beneficial with a lot of respect uh, from both parties because there seems uh, to be some elements of distrust. If you look at Burkina Faso, Mali, uh, they have strained uh, relationships with their colonial masters, uh, France. So what's your take on this and the need to show solidarity? I think uh, you're actually right. Uh, Europe and Africa have a complex history going back uh, uh, decades and centuries and uh, inevitably this plays into the present but it's extremely important that the past is not held to be a prison in order to build the future but any future is built from the ground up you know when you build a new house you don't start with a roof you have you may have a you may have a architect's plan, which is what the various visions and strategies that we've talked about uh, are like. But in the end, you have to start by uh, building strong foundations. And those foundations, are in, in when we come to the foundations for relationships between people or communities of nations or continents, the principles are uh, exactly the same. And that is that it has to be done from the bottom up. I think a lot of people-to-people -people exchanges, a lot of community, community exchanges, civil society exchanges, intellectual and academic exchanges are uh, very uh, as important, if not more so, before one has more strategic political partnerships. And I think these processes cannot be, cannot be hurried. I think on the issue of, of solidarity, uh, there is a cultural issue here. It's not to say that Europeans uh, don't feel the pain of uh, uh, terrible things going on in, uh, in Africa. Um, it, it is just that, uh, and I speak not, neither as an African or as a European, though I live in Europe, I speak as an Indian, as a nation. And I know that the way different cultures express their hearts and what's in their hearts is very, very different. So you mustn't uh, uh, jump to the conclusion that just because Europeans may appear cold, and formalistic, that they're not caring or feeling or sympathetic. At least that's not my experience living around uh, Europe for uh, most of my life now. And uh, Africans, on the other hand, uh, from my own experience of living in Africa, they're, ten they're warm people. Uh, I hate to generalize this across a continent or across anybody for that matter, so don't get me wrong. But the point is that we have to understand each other's culture and each other's way of expressing and at the base of it, I think there are more similarities and differences when, where ordinary people are concerned. So in summary, let's have more people-to-people -people diplomacy, more people-to-people -people exchanges, and let the relationship grow from the bottom up.
Thank you so much, Professor Kapila. And still talking about relationship growth between different nations. I mean, look at the European nations, Asian nations, and of course, Africa as a whole. Now, uh, uh, Colin, still looking at all of this and looking at the underlying issues of this Europe and the European nations and the AU African summit. Now, there was the Global Gateway Initiative. Different nations try to partner with Africa. We see China, the other hand. We also saw Europe saying that uh, we are a reliable partner. We are trustworthy. We are sympathetic to your plight. We understand what is going on in Africa. Looking at the relations uh, from China and Africa, how would you see this relationship uh, compared it with Europe and Africa? Yeah. Well, Europe has uh, suddenly become the bride after which every groom is running you, you and uh, africa yeah you can indeed uh, so that is actually illustrated by the heightened interest that um, the rest of the world have uh, shown um, you know in africa it is not only china with its um, belt and road infrastructure uh, strategy we are also looking at uh, turkey for instance even Russia, with all its um, you know uh, problems at the moment, uh, has been caught in Africa for quite a while. Japan, um, you know, uh, from far away Asia, is uh, also uh, doing its bit to get a piece of uh, the African cake. What is that piece of the African cake? Cake. It is the resources, both in actual terms but also in terms of the human capital deposit that is uh, currently in Africa awaiting exploitation. The only people in all of these that have not realized the value that they bring to the table is Africa themselves. And that is translated in the bad leadership, or let me say the poor leadership that uh, we have uh, in Africa. now. As long as African leaders, the current crop of African leaders, who, uh, permit me, are tired old men, mm. as long as they do not realize the value that they bring to the table and begin to negotiate from the position of strength, they will continue to be exploited. Take the uh, joint vision for Africa uh, as a specific um, example, because I like to speak, uh, you know, stick to the topic. The question remains, what is meant to finance this joint vision about 150 million uh, euros, I believe? Yeah. Is this meant to be a fresh injection of capital or was that conceived to be a recycling of old funds that are within the system? These are questions that need to be asked and answered, and then you begin to get a clearer picture of the intentions behind you know, some of these uh, jamborees that have been uh, taking place. So mm -hmm. um, I'm not making a statement either way. I'm actually saying that it is important for the EU to prove that they meant it when they say that they are actually giving up the paternalistic nanny diplomacy that has dominated, you know, the whole bulk of, um, you know, the last uh, century, the last decades, starting from, uh, you know, around the 60s when Africa gained independence, that they truly mean joint partnership when they say that is what they mean. So, what has happened in the past, I mean, nearly a year after the uh, AU-EU um, uh, summit, not very much has happened, actually feeds into that perception that the EU doesn't mean well, but it also reconfirms that the African leaders lack purpose and they need, they need to wake up. Thank you, uh, Mr. Collins. Okay. Now, Professor Kapila, there's a saying in Africa that charity stats uh, begins at home. Uh, the mantra, look inwards, Africa's solutions to Africa challenges, no to foreign interference, has frequently been publicized across uh, several platforms on the African continent. As we speak, uh, cocoa doesn't grow in Europe. Uh, where you are in Switzerland, there's a Lint Museum, a chocolate museum, where they exhibit 
cocoa and all of that. But yet, uh, a lot of those resources are taken from Africa. So how can Africa look inwards and, you know, do uh, and industrialize and achieve more? Do you think, uh, what, what does Africa need to do? Bear in mind that, I mean, no continent is an island. We still need to trade uh, with people. How do we put our best foot forward as a continent? So I think um, no continent is an island. And quite honestly, all the cocoa that Africa grows would be worthless if uh, someone out there in the world wasn't uh, making chocolate uh, out of it. Mm -hmm. So that interdependency is really the way the world works. And every continent that produces something, whether it is uh, Ethiopian coffee or West African cocoa, it's a kind of source of pride to the to the continent, and it, there's an exchange that takes place. All that is, all that is all that is good. Uh, African solutions for African problems. It doesn't mean looking so much inwards mm. that one forgets forgets to see solutions and ideas coming from the outside world. But I think local solutions for local problems means being more resilient, being looking into the into your own culture to find uh, uh, ways. Uh, for example, uh, the many proverbs that my African friends are always quoting all the time uh, shows that there is a traditional wisdom uh, out there, and the ability of uh, African uh, Africans to communicate externally without appearing all the time to be attacking the rest of the world. So, you know, the dialogue nowadays between Africans and, say, Europeans and Americans always goes back to colonialism. You know, when, uh, when uh, these people uh, enslaved uh, uh, Africans, when this happened, when that happened. Now, when you are at the receiving end of that dialogue, if you happen to be a European or an, or an American, and you get this constantly from Africans, uh, you know, that there were bad people that did terrible things to the continent, that doesn't create an atmosphere where they are going to listen to you in the same way. So I think yeah, it's... Yeah, but it's they, they still... I mean, Africa is still reeling for some of the effects. And I think uh, they, they, they're valid conversations, but maybe not just hammering on it all the time. I, I guess that's what you're trying to say, if I... Uh, uh, well, I'm, <laughs> yes, I'm saying that, but also I'm saying more positive promotion. More pro pro positive promotion not to get something... Uh, but uh, more in terms of uh, highlighting the many, many strengths uh, on, the, on the continent. And I would uh, honestly start with the knowledge base and the culture base, and not just the economic or other, other areas. The important thing is that people should, uh, uh, should uh, like each other. And, uh, you know, this concept of likeness in politics is not uh, uh, very well studied. So, for example, one can, be, one can admire another country, another country's economy or another country's leadership even. Uh, but whether or not you like that other uh, country is another question. So how do we get Africans to be liked by other people? And the other way around is one of the people-to-people -people diplomacy I was talking here early, earlier on. And this is where local approaches are absolutely, and cultural approaches are absolutely a strength. Okay, Professor Kapila, I'd like to start with you because you are not African. And we know that in June last year, I mean, in February, when they had this EU-AU summit, now one of the areas that they agreed on was reciprocal partnership for migration mobility. Now, at the first start, when you started, you talked about uh, the, uh, the Ukraine war and how much has affected uh, uh, this AU-EU deal. Now, in June last year, we saw about more over 30 people die at the Melilla enclave due to the fact that there was unlawful force by authorities at that particular point. Now, still looking at Ukraine, we had Africans who were in Ukraine. We saw lots of news about discrimination going on. Do you believe that there has been fair treatment of African migrants in Europe? Oh, uh, the, the answer to the question is uh, very easy. And that is, no, there hasn't been uh, fair treatment. And I think Africans who are migrating for all sorts of reasons, um, uh, and generally it's forced migration, um, either for political reasons or economic uh, reasons or social, or social reasons. No, they are treated extremely badly. And, and this is a, a blot, if you like, on the conscience of uh, Europeans. Uh, the only saving grace is that there are many, many European uh, people and organizations that uh, think the same. Uh, and uh, I think there, isn't an, there is not an easy solution to this, other than to say that uh, I think we must continue the struggle for human rights, whether it is in the area of migration 
or very often human rights problems in the in the area of migration are a reflection of wider human rights problems in society, either in the originating countries from where the migrants come, in this case, Africa we are talking about, or in receiving uh, uh, countries as well on the periphery of Europe who receive these migrants in the first place. Uh, thank you, Professor Kapila. Now, callers, just before we wrap up, uh, we can't have this discussion without uh, looking inwards. The African Union was set up for the vision to defend the sovereignty, territorial integrity, and independence of its member states, accelerate the political and socio-economic integration of the continent, promote defend Africa's common positions and issues of interest to the continent and its people. Uh, the AU has had its critics. Uh, people have referred to it as an old boys club that only fathers the interest of this uh, fellow president. Has the African Union, in your opinion, been able to live up to this uh, lofty ideas and its responsibilities? No, they haven't. 